Hello, welcome back. In today's video, we're going to be continuing our DP700 exam preparation course. And in this video, we're going to be focusing on Spark Engine, notebooks, the lake house, all of that good stuff. We've got a bit of a selection of different topics that I think are important for you to know and understand for the DP700 exam. So let's dive straight into it. So just before we begin, I'm just going to say that the aim of this session is not to teach you Python, PySpark, notebooks, all of that stuff completely from scratch. You know, these are very large topics in and of themselves. So I do recommend that, you know, you have a solid foundation in Python and the Spark engine. I've got videos about a lot of those different things. So make sure you have a look at those as a background. We're going to be going through some notebook fundamentals. So we're going to be looking at the different languages that are supported in Fabric Notebooks, how to implement parameters. So parameter cells, how we can parameterize our notebooks. And we're also going to be talking a little bit about notebook utils. Now we've looked at notebook utils from the perspective of orchestration using the notebook dot run multiple method. But notebook utils is a very broad ranging package and it's important to understand what the capabilities there are at least for the exam. Then we're going to be looking at some different methods for table creation in a notebook using Spark SQL, PySpark and the Delta library as well. We're also going to be talking about data cleaning and transformation and you know, we're not going to be going into much detail there because it's a very broad range of topics and I've covered them a lot in the DP600 and in the Spark series that I did over a year ago now, probably near 18 months now, but I'll link to all of those as well. But we'll talk about what is required for the DP700, what you need to be aware of. We'll also go into a lot of detail about loading methods. So we'll be implementing full loading and incremental loading using PySpark. Now, what's not covered in this notebook, but is important for the exam, is understanding about version control, CICD of notebooks, thinking about monitoring and optimization of Spark. And we'll look at that in some of the lessons toward the end of this course and also error handling as well. Okay, so to get started, what I've done is I've created a lake house and currently this lake house is pretty much empty. There's no tables in here. There's a few files. So HubSpot contacts test and updates. And we'll be using those as we, as we go through the notebook here. But for now, we don't need to worry about those. We're going to begin by talking a little bit about the notebook in general, because, you know, there's quite a lot of functionality built into the notebook as an object itself before we even get into Spark. So the first thing that I would highlight is the multi-language support. So we can now create lots of different types of notebooks. We're going to be focusing today on the Spark engine, right? Specifically, mostly PySpark, but also some Spark SQL as well. We've also got in preview is the Python, pure Python notebooks and the T-SQL notebooks. So that's what we were using in the last exercise, in the last video in this series, the T-SQL notebooks. So just note that there's a variety of different languages that we can now use in this notebook experience. The second one to be aware of is notebook parameters. So we can create cells in our notebooks and then we can come in here and I mean, I've already toggled this as a parameter cell, but you'll see down here, toggle parameter cell. And what that essentially means is it turns this cell into a parameter cell. So we can initialize some variables in here, parameter one, param two, give it some default values. But essentially when you orchestrate this notebook from a data pipeline, for example, or using notebook utils, we can pass in some values, some new values into these variables via this parameter cell so that we can basically parameterize our notebook and make it dynamic. The third one, just to get us started, is around the notebook utils package. Okay, so it's a Python package that is created and maintained by Microsoft. And it's got a variety of utility functions that can help us perform common tasks in Fabric. So there's lots of different sections here. I recommend taking a look at the documentation if you haven't already. Here we've got things for file system utilities, like moving files, deleting files, that kind of thing. Notebook utilities, so running notebooks, for example. We've got credentials, so getting secrets from an Azure Key Vault is very useful for that. We've also got Lakehouse utilities, which is quite useful. You can use that to write delta tables, especially even in the Python experience, so without PySpark. That's why they renamed the name of this thing. It Previously, it was MS Spark utils, but now it's more general, right? We can use some of these utilities, all of these utilities across both the Python notebook and the PySpark notebooks as well. So these are some common methods that you might want to think about using. 
depending on your use case. So reaching from the file system package within Notebook Utils, you've got the .mv. It's very similar if you're used to using like bash commands on the command line. It's a similar syntax for that, obviously in Python. We've also got notebook.runmultiple, which we looked at in a previous video, and credentials.getsecret if you want to get a secret from Azure Key Vault securely. So let's talk about some table creation methods that are available to us in Spark in Fabric. So the first one, you can use Spark SQL to create your table like so. All right, so that has finished executing. So we can just press refresh here. Hopefully we've got a table in here, very creatively called my table underscore Spark SQL. And it's essentially just patient ID, gender, scholarship. It's just a data set for patients or healthcare. Doesn't really matter. Spark SQL is a great option if you're coming from a T-SQL world, like data warehousing world, and you get the benefits of the power of the Spark engine, and you can write Spark SQL, which is similar to T-SQL in many ways. Now, another method, if you want to be using PySpark, then we can use the Delta Tables library, import Delta Table, and essentially we can use that to create or replace a table. So it's going to work by normally specifying your schema using this PySpark schema. So we need to import these PySpark types like struct type, struct field, and then all of the different types for the columns that you want to create in your schema and therefore in your table. And then we can call delta table dot create or replace, pass in the current Spark session, which is automatically generated in Fabric. You don't need to create that yourself and then give it a table name, add your columns and then execute. The Delta table library is something that we're going to be looking at a lot because we can use it for lots of things in interacting with lake houses, building tables and loading tables, either doing full loading or incremental loading. So now if we refresh this, we've also got our PySpark table in here and our Spark table, Spark SQL, sorry. So once we've got some data in our tables, you might want to think about cleaning and transforming those different tables. Now, for the purposes of this video, I'm not going to go into detail about you know, lots of different cleaning and transformation techniques. All I would say is that for the exam, make sure you're familiar with data frame manipulation, cleaning, filtering with column or columns to add new columns onto your data sets, that kind of thing. Filtering group by aggregations, this kind of like PySpark basics and joining. Again, got lots of different hands-on tutorials in Fabric Dojo for those kind of things. Or you can look at my Spark video on YouTube where we go through a lot of those basics. So next we're going to talk about table loading techniques. And for this, I'm just going to switch over to some slides that I've created for this. And then we'll come back and we'll look at the implementation in notebooks. So let's talk about full and incremental loading. So data engineers have a lot of different tasks normally that are asked of them on a project. But one of the core goals of data engineering in general is to build pipelines that keep source systems and analytical systems in sync, right? So you might have lots of different source systems, might be Postgres, might be Azure SQL, you know, whatever your different source systems, it might be some sort of operational database. If we want to perform any sort of analytics on that data, we need to get a copy of it in fabric somewhere so that we can do our machine learning, we can build our semantic models and that kind of thing on top of it. So we've got some data in a source system. We have to find a method of extracting that data, loading it into fabric. And then when the data changes in the source system, we need our process to be capable of keeping these two in sync, right? So grabbing what's changed or grabbing all of it again, loading it into fabric so that we can build our reports, our analytics, machine learning models, that sort of thing on top of the data. And that data is a true reflection of what we have in the source system. So we need to talk about how we're gonna do this bit in the middle, because there's lots of different ways that we can do this. So now let's talk about some different options that are available to you as a data engineer for performing this, keeping the source system and the analytical system in sync in Fabric. Well, the obvious one is database mirroring. If your source system supports database mirroring, that effectively makes this job of keeping the two in sync very easy, right? That's one of the key features of database mirroring. You don't need to worry about this ETL process, this delicate dance of getting these two systems in sync and keeping them in sync, which is quite difficult. Database mirroring makes that a lot easier, but it's only for certain source systems, right? Azure SQL, Snowflake, 
Cosmos DB and some other ones that they're working on like Azure SQL Managed Instance. That one's in preview. The other option is to perform a full load every time, right? So if we have all of this data in our source system, well, it's very easy just to take absolutely everything in there and load it into Fabric, right? We can do a drop and replace and just rebuild this table every single time. Some of the pros of that is that you know, it's very simple to do that, can be quite quick to do that as well, but it's gonna use a lot of your capacity usage, especially if you've got big data sets that you're constantly writing every hour, you're kind of dropping them and rewriting them every single hour. It's gonna use a lot of your capacity units. Now we can perform the full load. It's well supported in pretty much every tool that we have in Fabric, right? We can use Dataflow Gen 2, copy jobs, notebooks with uh, PySpark Overwrite, for example, and data pipelines. You know, normally a full load will be with Overwrite. And you can see that you know, most of the main tools, this is fully supported. The other loading option that you'll hear is incremental loading. And by that, what we mean is here, we've just got three rows that have changed in between our two scheduled sinks. And therefore we're gonna load this data incrementally, meaning we're only gonna change what's changed and we're gonna leave the majority of the table completely as it was. Obviously this has the benefit that normally incremental loads are a lot quicker because you're only dealing with a very small subsection of the data, especially on very large tables. It's a little bit more tricky to implement, at least in Fabric. You know, they're slowly introducing support in the Dataflow Gen 2, but it's a preview or limited support. Similarly with the copy job, I think there are still some limitations around the destination that you can do this with in a copy job. Notebooks is fully supported and we'll look at how we can do that with PySpark with the Delta Tables library in a minute. Data pipeline currently is not supported. So let's go and look at how we can perform full loading and incremental loading within our notebooks. All right, so we're back in Fabric now and let's just demonstrate some full loading and some incremental loading with the tools that are provided to us within Spark Notebooks. So just to get us started, I'm gonna read a CSV file, the one that we had in my files area, this one here, Hardspot Context Test, and we're just gonna load that into a Spark data frame, explore some different syntax for loading this data frame into a lake house. So first things first, we have the creation of a lake house table using save as table. So in this method, we're writing the contents of our data frame into a table called HubSpot underscore contacts. And because we're using save as table, we don't need to specify a full path. It's gonna assume that we mean in this tables area. So we can just run that like so. Here we're using a mode of overwrite, which essentially means you know we're doing a full load every time. It's gonna ignore what's in that table and it's just gonna overwrite it basically. So if we just do refresh on that one, now we see that HubSpot contacts come through. Now let's just talk about a few different pieces of syntax that we can use to do the same or different things, just so that you're pretty comfortable with df.write and how that works. So in this example, we're using df.write again. The format is still delta. So we're writing delta tables here. The mode is overwrite. This time we're using .save. And when you're using .save, you need to specify the full path, right? Because obviously you can use .save to save managed delta tables in the table section and also unmanaged tables, as we'll see down here. So let's just run this one, refresh the table. So that one was a managed table using save, this one here. So that one's worked correctly. Now the benefit of using save is that, you know, if you want to save a delta table in the unmanaged section, just in the files area, then you can also do that. So save is more flexible. So this time we're gonna refresh the files area and we can see that we've got this unmanaged table using save down here. So that's some of the different syntax for full loading using df.write with mode of overwrite. Let's look at incremental loading. So there's a few different methods, you know, with Spark, there's always normally more than one way of doing something. Let's look at the Spark SQL merge statement first. So this time what I'm gonna do is I'm loading this HubSpot contacts updates. So that's some updates that we want to merge into an existing table. And for this one, what I've done is I've loaded it into this updates DF data frame, and then I've created a temporary view called contacts updates. So when we're doing Spark SQL merging, we essentially need to create a temporary view so that we can reference that in our Spark SQL statement. And our Spark SQL looks a bit like this. Let's just run this and see, explain how this one works. So the key statement here is merge into. So Merge is something that is currently only available in Spark. They're adding it to the T-SQL experience, but 
you know, that could be end of Q1, I believe. It's on the roadmap for 2025. So up until this point, the easiest way of doing merge statements, so incremental loading, is within the Spark experience. Now it is of course possible to do that in T-SQL, you just have to code it yourself. But let's just continue with the syntax. So it's merge into HubSpot contacts as that's the target table using contacts updates. So that was the temporary view that we created up here, contacts updates. Then we're just gonna do a simple on target.customerid equals to source.customerid. So we're defining on, you know, what's the common key between these tables. And then you'll see this when matched, then update set all, and then insert all when it's not matched. Essentially what this means is that, you know, we're merging on these two columns. So when there is a common key between the update data set and the existing table, currently, because we've done this set star, which basically means we're just gonna write the whole row into the target table as it exists in the source table. We'll look at an example where you can get a bit more precise over which columns you want to update and when, but that's what this is currently saying. We've also got when not matched. So when you've got something in the source customer ID that it doesn't exist currently in the target, then you're just gonna insert fully that entire row into the target table. And you get this kind of summary down here of the number of rows that we've just merged. In this example, they were all updates. None of them were deleted, none of them were inserted. Okay, let's look at a similar example, but this time we're gonna be using our Delta table library for doing a similar thing. First things first, we need to read our Delta tables into a variable. This time it's called HubSpot contacts. And for that, I'm using Delta table dot for name. So either you can use for name or for path. For name, you just pass in the name of your table if it exists in the Fabric Lakehouse tables area up here, which it currently does. So what that's doing is it's reading the contents of this table, storing it in this variable here, and then it's using that as kind of like the root of the merge, right? So it's the, the target table for our merge. Then we're calling dot merge on the updates dear, which we defined above. That was this one here. So we're reading that the updates data into this updates df. Again, we're defining our merging condition here. And this time we can do when matched, update all, when not matched, insert all, and then execute. So it's a very similar syntax. We're just defining it with Python rather than Spark SQL. 